<laughs> All right, good morning. Don't be scared. Wow, I'm usually not that effective. <laughs> you obviously must not know me because it usually takes about five minutes before people settle people, uh, down when I, when I welcome them. Um, Thank you all so much for being here today. I'm John Hayes. I'm the Dean of the Warner College Net of Natural Resources. And it's my distinct pleasure and, and honor to, um, to introduce our moderator today. But before doing so, I want to make one quick announcement um, regarding another, another uh, seminar that's coming up in a day. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that's, that's on a similar topic. And tomorrow, um, April 19th at 11 a.m. in Wagar 133, Stephanie Green from the University of Alberta will be talking on effective conservation needs, diverse model, uh, excuse me, effective conservation needs, diverse values, approaches, and practitioners. So I um, encourage you all to try to take the time to, to join in in that as well. So. And it really is a pleasure and um, to, to introduce our speaker today and really to kick off this um, final event in the Human Dimensions and Natural Resources seminar series this, this semester because the topics that are being discussed and have been discussed throughout the semester are so near and dear to my heart, but they're also really fundamental to a number of things that we're trying to do within each of the academic departments in, in Warner College and, and at the college level as well. Um, you know, it's, it's become very clear to me and to many of you as well, I'm sure, that, uh, that we're faced with a significant problem here. And that problem <coughs> is that, you know, if you look around our college and if you look around natural resource programs throughout the country, the demographic makeup of our programs is out of sync with the demographic nature, uh, the demographic makeup <coughs> of our communities <coughs> and our country. And while there's a, diff a number of different ways you could look at this, you know, I think there's concerns from an equity and social justice perspective on that. But there's, in, but even if that is not your focus on this. I think we have significant societal concerns with that dislinkage into the future. I, I felt like, you know, if the leadership of our nation in natural resources and conservation, and if the people that really are passionate about and care about the types of values that I suspect we all share uh, in this room today, are reflected only by the demographics of the people that are going through our programs, we're in big trouble. Mm -hmm. And we really did need to do a much more effective job of reaching out to underserved and underrepresented communities, to bring them into our programs, to train them to, to move on to leadership roles in the field. And so I'm so excited um, that, that the se this seminar series is really focused on, on a number of those topics. And, and we have a wonderful panel here today to, um, to really address various elements of that from their own perspectives, you know, everything from local to state and national and international perspectives on that. And so I have a suspicion you didn't really come here to hear me talk, so let me introduce our, our moderator today, uh, Luis Benitez. And uh, it's a real pleasure um, to be able to introduce Luis Luis is currently at the director of the Outdoor Recreation Industry Office for the, for the state of Colorado. And he's actually the, the first and only director in that position that, that we've had. He's been in that role since 2015 when he was appointed into that, that position by uh, Governor Hickenlooper. And Luis's personal background and passions are so perfectly aligned with this position. It's, it's hard to imagine anyone fitting in that role more effectively than Luis. Luis is an avid outdoors person um, and spent his career conducting mountaineering, climbing and skiing courses for the Outward Bound Professional Development Program. And, uh, and later in his career, uh, really developed a strong passion with respect to um, high altitude mountaineering. Luis, uh, 
has led numerous parties to some of the highest elevations on our planet, and uh, including um, uh, at least half a dozen, maybe more, ascents of, of Mount Everest, and one, one of which uh, was a, a, um, an excursion that you may have heard of where he led uh, blind athlete Eric Weinheimer, is that right? Very good. Okay, to the summit. Um, Luis has also had a strong engagement with education and outreach throughout his career, and he helped create the profit, uh, the, excuse me, the nonprofit Trekking for Kids, which focuses on service-based expeditions, allowing participants to climb and trek while teaching them about local issues like housing and health care for orphans around the world. The, the position that Luis is in is particularly important because of the importance of outdoor recreation, both in our own individual lives, but also to the, the, um, the economy of the state of Colorado and our nation. The outdoor recreation industry in Colorado is responsible for over $28 billion in uh, consumer spending and $2 billion of taxes annually. It's, um, it, the, the contribution that our recreation industry provides for the nation's um, gross national product exceeds that for mining, oil, and gas. So, Luis, it's a pleasure to have you here, and I'll let you introduce the, the panelists, but please join me in, in welcoming Luis to the podium. There we go. Thank you, sir. Inez, thank you very much, Professor Gasta. Um, and I also want to acknowledge a uh, former, I guess always RAM, in the room, my counterpart, Director Bravo, Dominic Bravo, from the state of Wyoming to our north. Dom, thank you for being here. You know, this conversation that I want to have over the next couple of hours is one that I think, regardless of your gender, regardless of your race, regardless of the things that you focus on, is a question that is a constant when it comes to how we do what we do simply as human beings. And I am really honored today to be standing up here moderating a panel of three people that I consider colleagues and also very, very close friends. You will not find three people working more diligently and more passionately on this subject than the people that are sitting here in front of you today. So what I'd like to do is go over a little bit about um, you know, my journey to get to this point and, and sort of what it means moving forward for the nation. And then what I'd like to do is introduce our three panelists and allow them a little bit of time to explain the scale and scope of work that they're doing. I've got a few questions that I want to ask them, but then I really want to get into it. I want to open it up and have an open conversation with everyone in the room and also include our friends from Wyoming to the north to talk about some of the initiatives that they're focused on as well. So let me say straight off the bat, there is no question that is too taboo in this room to ask. Hopefully you've seen an evolution when it comes to diversity and inclusion to not just be about race and gender, to also incorporate the LGBTQ community, what it means to be in the outdoors. We're faced with unprecedented circumstances regarding immigration, regarding inclusivity, regarding things connected to the outdoor industry that really have never been discussed before in the context that they're currently being discussed. So as we're blabbing up here for the next little bit, I want you to be thinking about the questions that you'd like to bring forward the things that you'd like to discuss. Because again, and I'm gonna hammer this point over and over and over again, these three folks and their brain collectively is a pretty extraordinary thing. So if you would have told a wheezy, asthmatic, half Latino, half Italian kid that grew up between Ecuador and St. Louis, Missouri, I'm one of the few Latino hillbillies you'll ever meet, <laughs> that someday he would be representing a multi-billion dollar economy responsible for hundreds of thousands of jobs, and starting a national conversation about the political depth and gravity of our industry and our economy, that little wheezy asthmatic kid who grew up with Spanish and Italian in the house, 
had funny rituals when it came to the holidays that none of my neighbors and friends really understood, would have told you that you were nuts. Because it's just not something that was a part of our paradigm. Yet the challenge that I think we're, that's in front of us today and our three panelists are working very hard to address and grow is how do you take that opportunity and encapsulate it in a holistic fashion? How do you move some of those things down the field in a way that you find that inclusion rather than exclusion and you can do it in a, in a really wholesome and passionate way? So I'm going to start from the left to the right because I think that's probably the, the best way to do it. So Loretta, this fine woman that you see in front of you here. Anybody in the room ever heard of environmental learning for kids? I always like to challenge some of this stuff. What have you heard? What do you know? And if you've you worked with the ELK, no fair. You can't, you can't give me the normal marketing spiel. What have you heard? What is it? Other than environmental learning for kids. Yes, sir. It's urban kids from Denver and um, have experiences immersed in nature. Okay. I believe founded by a graduate of our department. Wow. <laughs> Bonus points. <laughs> so Loretta served for 33 years to the state of Colorado for the Department of Natural Resources, and she retired in 2014 and realized that there was still more work to do. So when it came to her efforts with elk, I'll let her um, get into it in a minute, but the thing that I want to share with you that's kind of exciting to me from an industry perspective and from a public and private partnership perspective, when you think of elk, and this is no offense to Loretta or elk, you think, oh, another nonprofit trying to get underserved youth into the outdoors because it's a good thing to do. Makes your heart warm, makes you feel good, but if I, you can't throw a stick in Colorado mm -hmm. without hitting a nonprofit focused on those things. Yet here is one of those unprecedented moments in time. Anybody heard of the North Face, the gear company? <laughs> Multi-billion dollar multinational company. Ever, anybody hear about their initiative, Walls Are Meant for Climbing? Anybody seen those t-shirts? Kind of a poke to a current administration's policy on a few things, but also this extraordinary effort to get kids in socioeconomically challenged communities outside and discovering the joys of bouldering and rock climbing. Guess where their first location is for their multi-million dollar project? Mm. Montbello, Colorado. Guess what is in the backyard of this project? The new Environmental Learning for Kids Center that Loretta's been working passionately on. So the connectivity between public and private partnerships, instead of just being another nonprofit, now Loretta and Elk is connected to a multi-billion dollar brand that believes what they believe. So, the needle is shifting. So I want to stop there and allow Loretta to tell, talk a little bit about herself and then we'll kind of keep working down the, the road. Loretta? <laughs> thank you, Luis, and uh, thank you, Dean Hayes and Mark for inviting me <coughs> and really honored to be here today. So uh, thanks so much. And I'm really, uh, really pleased to see all the young women in this room. So <laughs> uh, just talking about equity and inclusion. So it's really great. Probably 10 or 15 years ago, we wouldn't have seen that. So really hope that you all stick with your careers in natural resources if that's what you're choosing. So um, just want to give you all a shout out for, uh, for picking these majors and picking this, this opportunity. Um, but uh, environmental learning for kids, I can tell you a little bit about that, but a little bit about myself. As Louise said, I, I worked for 33 years for the Department of Natural Resources. Um, I failed retirement and uh, am now the executive director for ELK, but while I was at DNR, I worked for the Division of Reclamation, Mining, and Safety, and for many years worked in the restoration part of that division, doing work at abandoned mines and uh, restoration work. I was definitely a bureaucrat and administrator, but really surrounded myself with really great scientists and people and, uh, you know, really great mentors that were able to bring me along. So it's always great to find that other adult in your life that can, uh, you know, bring you to, to meetings and, and help you in your career. So I'm really thankful and grateful to a lot of great people that, that I met along the way. And so, um, so after retirement, I did take this job with Environmental Learning for Kids. Um, we serve um, and embrace families in far northeast Denver, uh, the Montbello and Green Valley Ranch neighborhood. We probably serve about 5,000 kids a year, and that's through different outreach that we do. Uh, intensely, we probably serve about 250 students, um, again, ages 5 to 25, because we serve families. We also have 
a um, small um, summer employment program where we employ 10 to 12 um, high school and early college students and so um, they're able to help us with programming throughout the year as well so um, we do uh, after school programs for students we get them uh, interested in different sciences um, after school and then um, try to move them to coming to our um, full day programs on the weekends taking them hiking fishing and all along the way trying to instill some of that STEM education and uh, don't tell them that they're learning because they're also having fun but uh, but my challenge is to really get them uh, more involved in these STEM careers and actually get them into to programs like here at Warner College so you know that's really why I'm here today is to really find out how we can bring more of our students um, into CSU we do a lot of college trips we go all over we go to CU CSU uh, we just recently went to uh, NAU to Na uh, uh, Arizona uh, University Northern Arizona and so we try to get our students out so they can see all of the different types of opportunities that are available but still struggle struggle with getting them into the sciences and into these careers I had two students I don't know if they'll come uh, this morning um, they're in class and may come later they had both chosen science um, originally and have both changed their majors already after the first um, semester so you know a lot of challenges there you know I want them to find their passion I mean they come to this big university and find a lot of different things that they can be and do so you know I, I do want to set them on on a good path but but just also challenged by that that opportunity and um, you know what it takes to to really diversify um, you know a great school and great college um, like CSU and I am a CSU alum I went to school here a long time ago but um, you know it's really great to see all the changes and um, the resources that are put into this university are really incredible so I'm just really excited to be back here and um, I hope we can really have that conversation uh, with my colleagues about how we kind of move that needle and see what we can do um, to help um, the elk students along thanks Loretta so the guy to Loretta's right you might think is just a, a handsome fellow from South Central LA <laughs> <laughs> but I will argue with anyone in this room that he is truly at this moment the hardest working man in show business when it comes to engaging youth <laughs> in the outdoors and trying to foster the next generation of conservation-minded outdoorists and leaders. So Juanito, or Juan, if you want to be professional about it, Juanito's. don't let the handsome <laughs> face fool you. Like I said, he has worked for everyone from the Obama administration through the My Brother's Keeper initiative, all the way down to working with tribal communities in Alaska to foster a cultural exchange program called Fresh Tracks. He literally travels the boundaries of our country and beyond, trying to create this conversation within an organization called the Children and Nature Network to figure out how you incorporate academic learning, passion for the outdoors, and the next generation that would never, frankly, have an opportunity to even touch this aspect of daily life without the support of that organization and Juan's efforts. So Juanito, you want to tell a little bit more about the work that you do yeah. and who you are? Man, I need the transcript to that right. intro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it's, yeah, those are magical words. <laughs> um, so, buenos dias. Buenos tardes? Buenos dias. So, I, Juan Martinez uh, from South Central LA, first generation high school graduate, uh, first generation to go on to college, uh, went to community college and transferred over to, to, to a four year college. And, um, and was on my way to being a, 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 a lawyer around political campaign organizing. Uh, so everything about this would not tell you that as I sit here before you today, I am a National Geographic Explorer. I am a TET speaker. I sit on the governing council for the, the Wilderness Society um, and the Sierra Club Foundation previously. So. And I serve as the VP of uh, Strategic Partnerships with the Children and Nature Network, which was founded by Richard Louf, who uh, many of you might have heard of a little book that he wrote called mm -hmm. The Last Child in the mm -hmm. Woods. How many of you have read that book real quick? All right, great. 
I love it when there's not that many hands up because uh, what Rich did in, in that book, he catalyzed a, a grassroots movement around this concept of what it meant, uh, what he coined, and this is his theory, is nature deficit disorder. Uh, and so within this generation, the millennial generation and, and the previous generation, you see a disproportionate uh, uh, misconnection or something happening between the two generations. Um, how many of you uh, can remember a time when you actually had to go to the wall and pick up a phone? <laughs> All right, yeah. Uh, as opposed to those of us who raised our hands, uh, there's a generation that is uh, what, what is being termed now as tech native. They, from early on, the only thing they know how to communicate with is a screen in front of them. Uh, on average, teenager, a U.S. teenager spends 45 hours uh, connect, uh, connected in front of a screen. For, con uh, for context, that's a full-time job with benefits. <laughs> um, and so at the Children and Nature Network, what we do is three things. One of them is uh, look at the research. We're the first organization to anchor a National Science Foundation research on childhood development and the impacts of nature on ch uh, children's uh, development brain. Um, and we, uh, you are all welcome to uh, access our website and, and access this research, uh, curated research. It's free for all of you, especially as your students and looking for, the, for these kind of uh, resources. Um, the second piece that we do is we look at policies that increase equitable access for nature. And so we work with cities and towns across the country to look at their policies in place and uh, identify what those avenues are that are either uh, preventing uh, where they can increase or where they can modify some of their policies in place. So for example, how many of you know that there's HOAs nowadays that will make it illegal to build a treehouse? and looking at those policies and talking about that. Um, and then the third piece that we do is in, we empower uh, the leaders out there. And we recognize that there's leaders like all, all of us on, on this panel, all of you out there, and, and uh, really do that through uh, putting the tools in the hands of the leaders that are at the front line. Uh, and that's that research, that policy, and some leadership development that we do. Uh, one of the arms of that work that I helped uh, to found was the Natural Leaders Network. And so that's a millennial age bracket of 18 to 24 uh, uh, aged uh, leaders across the world who are connecting their communities <coughs> with nature and doing it through community empowerment. And one of those leaders is your very own Sarah Walker <laughs> here, <laughs> uh, who is a natural leader and has been one of our champions for, for a while and is now pursuing her PhD here at CSU. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll leave it at that. And uh, excited to be on this panel and, and grateful for all your time and space. Thanks, Benito. So the last person on our panel, but certainly not least, um, you know, I don't use the phrase poet warrior very often. Oh. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> am I right? <laughs> it's probably well, you're right, you're right. That's what I'm about to say. Guys. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, it's being recorded. You know, Jose Gonzalez as the founder of Latino Outdoors, truly was the gateway organization that shifted the dialogue for us nationally. How do you take a culture and a community and translate that into everything from political activism, understanding how to engage through culture, art, music, literature, and anchor the whole thing in the passion for the outdoors? Jose's efforts over the years in that regard have been extraordinary, and one could say that, that that's enough, right? But I would argue, Jose, the depth and gravity that and soul that you bring to the conversation. Um, if you don't follow this fella on any of the social media streams that he has, if you want your daily dose of inspiration, <laughs> you really should, because not a week goes by that I don't have at least one day or one post from Jose where I stop, I take a deep breath, and I realize my place and my value in the world. Mm. So, thank you, buddy. Um, um, Jose just really recently stepped down from running Latino Outdoors, and so there's a lot of us out there in the outdoor industry ecosystem that are really keeping our ear to the ground to understand what this man is going to do next. <laughs> because his exploration to find, found, and run LO 
and now understanding that there's still more work to do. Um, Jose, take it away. Talk about you and where you are. And you gotta, you gotta run that piece of wood over that. Yeah, Get us in the right mindset. Um, thank you. First of all, gracias, Luis. Gracias, gracias. Y igualmente, buenos días. And uh, uh, I was expecting from Juan, que hubo la familia. It's good to be here. Uh, a couple of things. First of all, number one is similar to the story, right? Like Juan and Loretta and, and, and Luis, this idea of like if you were to have asked that little six-year-old or ten-year-old, right? Or they're growing up, it's like, so what do you think is going to happen in 20 years maybe, right? 15, 20 plus years. Uh, how do you go from being like an immigrant kid, English language learner, migrant student from rural Mexico, uh, growing up in rural California, um, and then say, like, you're going to have this idea that you should go into education, you should be a school teacher, there's like an expected path for you to give back to the community, and then all of that is going to be different because then you're going to get to experience these amazing um, experiences, just like Luis, just like Loretta, just like Juan, you know, like <coughs> going to the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge and how does uh, carrying a responsibility to be a voice for your community, everything from like Department of Interior, the White House, um, to uh, funding spaces, but literally also making sure that when you walk down your neighborhood and like you look at your parents, uh, you both have the blessings to discuss Arrive, like I'm getting to do something that I think was not possible and I understand that I there's a difficulty in explaining to you what that means <laughs> because we didn't grow up camping or hiking in the traditional sense right I didn't get I didn't visit Yosemite until I was in college even though I lived two years away I mean two years two, two hours away <laughs> felt like two years maybe. Uh, and but we came with this literal deep authentic connection to the land, right? It was um, just like as Richard Luke describes in, in uh, Last Child in the Woods, growing up in a farm or growing up in a forest here, for me it was literally going out in rural Mexico and like the outdoors, the outside was there. Without thinking, I'm gonna go hiking or we're gonna go explore nature. It was just gonna go down by the river and play around and uh, have fun with my friends while also knowing that I had my grandmother or somebody else like grabbing water to do laundry or whatnot, or going up with my grandfather to tend to the crops. Um, and then transferring that to coming to the United States, whole new different type of nature experience in that A, the, agri you know, the agricultural heartland is very different as an agri agricultural landscape than Mexico, right? Um, but then also beginning to really look at this, uh, this idea of a protected landscape. It's not that there aren't national parks in Mexico, clearly, but it's different to then think about, like, now I'm going to go to something called a state park. Now I'm going to go to something called a wildlife refuge. And there's specific rules and regulations and guidelines. Uh, and even, even expectations about what you do here and, and what it means. So the reason I share that is because uh, Latino outdoors as an idea to me was like simple and obvious and I was mm -hmm. looking for that as a sense of community and place and ultimately a platform. So to start that and then turn that over to the community and then build it as an organization and now leave that because uh, part of the journey is kind of looking at where do you feel like you can have more influence um, and impact and where can you not and I realize that for me, it's about being able to continue to build and create spaces and platforms in which we can open that up. You know, I look a lot of towards the leadership of Loretta, Juan, and Luis about the responsibility we have in not owning a space, but creating a space and opening it as much as possible for everyone that's coming along with us and right behind us in the ways that weren't there. So that's why my next uh, steps are about how can I continue to expand that in this intersectionality, not just of the nature movement, the conservation movement, the environmental movement, and the outdoor movement, outdoor industry movement, but continue to uh, connect that with, quote unquote, the expected issues and non-expected issues of immigration, 
of, uh, of you know, of housing challenges, of, gen of uh, identity making. Um, and then lastly, just knowing that um, that comes with the privilege. The privilege to be able to do this. And uh, I get to, to be a part of something that wasn't there before, I continue to build that. So it's both the, the, the trail is right over the corner and so I'm excited to see what's gonna happen there. So are we. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jose. Mm -hmm. So let's get into it. I wanna share a statistic with you to kind of set the landscape. So by 2060, people of color will account for 57% of the United States population, with the number of people who claim two or more races tripling in size. The U.S. is projected to become a majority minority by 2043, with no one group making up a majority. So think about those statistics for a minute, and think about our <coughs> level of cultural conversation and cultural integration. You know, I ask all the time of my colleagues and other people out there in the industry, can a person without claiming any of these cultures be a part of Latino Outdoors? How do we appreciate and celebrate inclusivity in this process? So it is a larger conversation. So I want to start with you, Gwen. I want to ask the question around academia given our setting mm -hmm. and the fact that you really bridge that gap between how to take that experiential education that we do outside with kids, and how does that translate to people in this room, other than becoming a leader, to try to move that along? In your experience, you know, what advice would you have for people in the room on how to translate that experiential education to success in the classroom? How would these folks get that same experience that you offer to the young adults? How does that translate in your mind? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, so, so that's a good question, um, and I'll quote uh, our former Secretary of Interior, Sally Jewell, who, uh, <coughs> who uh, in, in her campaign and in, in her uh, tenure as, as Secretary of Interior, one of, the, one of the things she would always say is the best classroom is the one without four walls. And I think that that really stands not only for the academic systems, because we've done research uh, throughout the country around how an ex outdoor experiential education uh, experience for uh, children between the ages of sixth and eighth grade will Im increase their math and science scores by 15 and 20 percent. Um, and we've done, done research studies around that and, and we've proven it. So it's that. It's no longer around this idea of it's, it's a nice thing to do to get kids outside because they have fun and they can be kids. That's certainly the heart piece of it, but I think we're moving at a pace where it's no longer justifiable just to, just to have the privilege to have that outdoor recreation opportunity. It is about having equitable access to educational opportunities that impact science, science math, and science, uh, STEM uh, uh, fields. Um, so that's one part, I think exposing the young leaders to that. The other part of that comes at, at this level here, as you are all students and, and, and looking at the outdoor recreation economy, the education economy, whether that is as you're thinking about your, your graduation date and what you do with that afterwards, where the jobs are, where the vacuums of uh, opportunity are for you to tap into. Um, that's the other part of the equation that I think we, we need to look at. Where is your, uh, where is your graduate degree, your degree uh, applicable in the real world? And how do you build uh, professionals and leaders within those fields so that they can be the bridge not only around that specific uh, topic, but also be, have an equitable mindset to, to identify those spaces of inclusion and diversity for you to be able to engage in. And then at the level beyond that, um, the research component of it. I think so much of the research that's been developed out there is uh, a lot of pat on the back, like we are um, a great institution and look at our research. We uh, have, uh, we, this is how percentage uh, is applied and, and we'll do some self-evaluation and congratulate ourselves and, and our fellow colleagues. Oftentimes you'll find that that research is so critical to talking to politicians, to talking to funders, to talking to uh, change agents, to be able to uh, Im implement the policies that need to create that equitable pathway to uh, everything that we want to see happen. And so 
uh, our challenge is not to just do research for the sake of doing research, but doing research so that it is applied research and actually making an impact in real life time. So Loretta, I want to ask you a, a question next, because you mentioned sort of this focus on STEM and, and sort of a shifting conversation around how we define STEM. And being one of those kids that would have clearly chosen dental surgery over statistics, <laughs> um, and I think if anybody out there loves statistics, go ahead, raise your hand. Be brave. <laughs> Anyone? Oh, I'm so happy. It's good. We need more people like you in the world. because. You know, to Juan's point, you know, data drives a lot of the valuation processes that we need for the defense around why these things are important and how we track and measure some of these things. So what, if any, secret sauce is there moving into the future to have a, a redefining and a reclaiming of the importance of STEM focus areas than we have right now, especially with shifting demographics? Um, sure. So I think one of the things is just the fact that, um, you know, there is a real movement for, you know, protection of our, of our public lands. And, you know, who's going to do that uh, when you see the statistics around, you know, the changing uh, demographics of our, of our population. So, you know, we all need to, um, you know, be a part of that protection um, in some way. Uh, whether it's through conservation or all of the science, you know, the science leading up to, to um, you know, forest health and uh, climate change and all of those things. I mean, it's just really important, um, you know, to take that next step. So, you know, that's where the STEM really comes into play in terms of, you know, the science, technology, engineering, and math. You know, to find some expertise and find some way for us to, you know, all be a part of that in order to kind of just protect our, um, you know, our environment and our, you know, ecosystem. So I think that all plays into that because, you know, I'm sure that you all have had, you know, biology and, ma I mean, you've been totally immersed in all of those, um, you know, STEM fields. And so, you know, that's where the challenge is for, you know, a lot of, the s of our students is, you know, we get them out to places where, um, you know, when they were down in Arizona, they did an archaeological study with people from the Forest Service. Um, we had them with reclamation specialists doing re-veg studies. I mean, they all get a chance to kind of m go along on all these professional development opportunities. They love to go uh, with Colorado Parks and Wildlife and do, be a boating ranger. I mean, everybody wants to do that, right? Uh, be out on the reservoir. And so they come back and they say, that's what I want to do. And then it's like, okay, you know, here's the curriculum, here's the, you know, what you need to do to kind of get there. And, you know, it can be a little bit heartbreaking for me when you see students really challenged with that kind of, you know, curriculum and academics. And so, you know, it goes back to, um, you know, elementary school and what are they doing in middle school and then high school and then making that transition to college, which, you know, is so important. And, you know, whether it's through, um, you know, community college or, you know, the four-year degree, how do we, you know, how do we make that, um, you know, applicable? And through all of the work that we do uh, through environmental learning for kids and, um, you know, there's Groundwork Denver, there's Mile High Youth Corps, there's a lot of different groups that, that we work with. And so it's like, you know, what kind of learning are they doing in that and how can that maybe be transferred to like almost like an AP course, you know, something that transfers from that experience that we're that we're giving in a lot of these nonprofits to something that became transferred to some credit in college, or something that you know gives them an advantage in terms of the knowledge they're bringing because they've had this experiential learning opportunity. So you know that's something I'd really like to explore because probably a lot of you have done that where you've done some kind of volunteer work or something and it just is on your resume as a volunteer and doesn't really translate to something that, you know, translates maybe to something that is a little bit more monetary in terms of, you know, what you're getting in terms of your, your college uh, academic career. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. I had just met a, anybody know the bike company in uh, Denver, Gorilla Gravity? Anybody heard of that mountain bike company? Again, another company in the industry, an amazing product. 
really great leadership. And the CEO and the COO were visiting Ford about six months ago, looking at composite materials. <coughs> They're trying to fiddle with the next gen of what comes next in the mountain biking industry and how to put together frames in a different way. And as they were talking to some senior leadership on their engineering team at Ford, right, in Detroit, one of the engineers there was like, would you, you guys do engineering at a really high level? I love mountain biking. I never in a million years thought I could go to engineering school and get a job where I could actually get paid at, de at a decent level working for a mountain bike company. Hmm. So he literally quit the job in Detroit <laughs> at Ford, had a, as he put it, an in the hallway interview with the guys from Gorilla Gravity. And said, listen, you, if you want to focus on this, I'm, I'm available. <laughs> Moved to Colorado, and according to him, is, is one of the happiest people in the marketplace right now. So challenging the definition of what you can do academically and how you can actually have a full-time career in the outdoor industry, I, I want to support what Loretta is saying. You don't just have to focus on natural resources or focus on some of the traditional modalities. There are also things out there right now in this burgeoning, exploding economy that you can get real work with real pay and real benefits and not have to live out of the back of your truck unless you choose to. <laughs> so, you know, along with that, um, and, and speaking of sort of those, those shifting ideas of what's possible in our current landscape, um, Jose, you know, we spoke about this a little bit before we got started. Immigration right now is really a hot political topic. And I, you know, I'll share this heartbreaking story because I think it's relevant. Um, I spoke to a friend in Colorado Springs who is um, in the United States without documentation right now. Her parents are in the same boat and she discovered this love of the outdoors and was deeply invested in a nonprofit in Colorado Springs, getting kids outside just like her, but finally came to this point where she told me, Luis, there's just been so much conversation about ice raids and agents popping out of behind trees in parking lots that I, I can't do it right now. I'm, I'm too worried that, that that's gonna happen. Given where we are right now, do you think this conversation disproportionately impacts people of color and, and how, how are we gonna get through this? Yeah. What do you think we need to do to address this? Vote, that's the first place to start. <laughs> there you go. Don't ever neglect your ability and power <coughs> uh, with decisions like voting because what we have right now politically is a consequence of that. You know, as, as, as it's often said, elections have consequences, <laughs> whether you choose to engage in it or not. So I think that's important. Um, and in getting through it, I mean, there's the reality that, that there's the system we work with now. Um, but politics go everything from local <coughs> to national. And one of the hopes is that we're getting as a response um, and even just as a reaction to the toxicity of the current uh, political climate is that you're getting record numbers, especially of women who are running, um, but other quote-unquote underrepresented leadership, frankly. And one of the pieces for me is, so I grew up in California, and often California gets picked as a model for A, B, or C, sometimes good, sometimes not. Um, but one of the narratives we've had there that we've kind of been keeping an eye over the past 10 plus years is how the national landscape is gonna model that. Because in California, you had under Governor Pete Wilson a very focused intent, basically attack on, on migrant and immigrant communities. Everything from like, we're gonna close off all public benefits. It's just, it was total distortion about this idea that <coughs> quote unquote, Latinos, specifically Mexican immigrants, are just running across the border. So the same narrative we're having now. We need to have the wall, all this toxic discussion and imagery. And you have propositions that got passed. Most of them ended up um, getting caught up and ultimately being defeated uh, through the court system. But the real impact and damage to communities, that, you know, that's there. And we're feeling it now. One of the ironies is that I think now it's spread out even more to everybody. It's all of a sudden even people with privilege really it's like, whoa, <laughs> what's this? <laughs> and there's a sense that communities of colors are saying like, welcome to the club, right? It's like, this is what it's been like for many, many years. 
So it's important to really look at what those connections of allyship are going to look like and continue to look like because they're popping up in every discussion. You talk about feminism, it's like what does that mean as white feminists and feminism in relation to women of color feminism and so forth. But the hope is this. So in California, the generation of activists, organizers, you know, that came out in response to, to, to this, to Pete Wilson and Prop you know, 187, 209 and so forth. Um, that's our current political leadership in California right now. The House, um, the Assembly, the Assembly Speaker is a Latino, Anthony Rendon. The Senate, uh, the Senate Leader is a Latino, Kevin De Leon, who is now running for Senate. And they came up with that experience, literally like fighting that uh, because it was an attack on their families, right? And right behind them is now a lot of other Latino leadership, especially Latina leadership, finally. Um, and it's like, where are the decision makers now? <laughs> where are the faces of the public institutions? Uh, Attorney General um, Becerra, Xavier Becerra, you know, he's like, I I'm now in this office, right? And as a response uh, to what's happening here. You have little statements that matter. You just had a undocumented uh, Latina be appointed to, to just a standard like California Financial Aid Commission. And that was like a huge deal <laughs> for people. It's like, what did you do? It's like, it's just an appointment. But it matters in terms of that representation, because I'll close <coughs> with these two points. That representation piece matter, matters in terms of how you see yourself reflected. Because if you're not used to that, you just take it for given, because you know you're represented wherever. This is why things like we can say with some humor, why Black Panther matters, and why it's doing well. Because guess what? This actually authentically made, looks like it was made for you, by you, to include you. And everybody else can join in that. But it's very different than saying, we made it, and if you want to be a part of it, you have to engage in it however you can. So that's one example. Um, most recently, about two years, yeah, well, I guess it was two years ago when we were at COILS. And we were excited because uh, Senator Bennett, at the time there, was, uh, he sponsored like the first congressional resolution to recognize like Latino presence, basically, and leadership in conservation in the outdoors. We got, we, got, we got really close, and all it took was one Republican senator to be like, no. And why that matters is because there hadn't been one before, period. And why it pissed us off was because then we saw some of the resolutions that get, did get approved that usually end up making it without any issues, like National Dog Day or whatever. Like all of these things, like <laughs> really? Uh, and we finally got the first one at the state level in California. There hadn't been something as simple that recognizes the value and presence and leadership of Latinos in environment and conservation before, period. Um, and the reason I share that is because I was with a group of 41 Latinas, undergraduate students who were pursuing careers in, in the outdoors and conservation. They got inspired and they self-organized. They're out having their camping leadership out and I brought this to them. And the amount of like joy and pride and excitement they saw at this, it, it was just amazing. Because I know it's those little moments that's gonna let them know these are little pieces that let you know there's a path that we're gonna get there and to be you know, the next Juan, the next Luis, the next Loretta. It's like you need those little reminders about it's not like there's a finished product, right? We're all ever evolving, but this is, we're, mm -hmm. we're help. you know. <laughs> That's why I like fresh tracks. It's like you're literally helping lay some of that track. So I'll close with this, yeah, that immigration is, it's not new. We've been having the same conversation every five, ten years. And I equate that with what, how we've been having the same conversation around diversity, equity, inclusion, and conservation in the nation of the outdoors. Since 1990, when we had a missed opportunity, since 2000, all of these. What is not new is that we keep delaying, and you, you're not going to change the demographics back. So it's just we're closing the gap at the point in which we just need to keep making those choices. We can only keep punting the can, so to speak. And so the community is watching about how not just politicians, like tackle comprehensive immigration reform, but who are the allies that support that? And that's why I work like Earth Justice, all, even outdoor brands that are kind of saying, if the community feels attacked in this way, then this is how we want to be present to support that. So, so some of those pieces.
Well, so now we're kind of crossing the bridge to the political conversation. So, um, you know, my next question will be for Director Bravo from Wyoming, because I think there's, there's merit to talking about this in, in the context of the job that Director Bravo and I have representing our states and our economies, and it's not just us. There are also six other states that have this role, and by summer, we're hoping for 10 or 11. So when you start getting that gang together, what do you talk about? And so in the context of economic development, conservation and stewardship, education and workforce training, the intersection between public health and wellness in the outdoor industry, you know, Jose, you said it pretty clearly. Voter apathy has kind of been in our way. Politics play a role in this conversation. And Director Bravo, I guess my question for you, the outdoor industry has become politically active, if not through our work and, and our offices, through efforts from the organizations that are sitting on our panel. I guess my question to you is, can, can we really make a difference with all this, in your opinion? And, and how does that relate to the, the diversity question in the outdoors, both for what you're doing in your state and, I, frankly, across the board? So would you mind speaking to some of that? Sure. Go Rams. That's mm -hmm. another. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Come on up. Why don't you want to come on up and take a. I don't know. I, don't, I won't take a seat, but. Don't that scare way, That way I don't feel like I'm talking to folks. Uh -huh. um, so, sure, give me a difficult question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Especially on film. So, uh, so, I guess for the way Wyoming has looked at this, and again, pretty much this whole panel, I've, I've been very blessed to meet and work with over the years, everything from getting advice to how we've been working on this idea of in inclusion, diversity, and equity in, in our, our division of state parks, first and foremost. Um, and then recently with this new outdoor recreation office, which we, we just got added to us uh, somewhat as a voluntold from our governor in uh, uh, November of last year. Um, so it's been exciting, but I think the biggest thing for us is, is we try to remove the politics, because obviously we're, we're a little bit of a different state than, than others. Uh, and for us, uh, and stealing a little bit from uh, one of my colleagues in Oregon, is we look at it as just service. We're, we're in a public service that provides the, these public lands and, and this enjoyment for getting outdoors to people. And so it shouldn't matter where you're from, who you are, who you love, all of those things. We just want to figure out how we serve uh, our constituencies. Um, one of the interesting conversations, and it actually was with Jose a couple years ago, um, I, I think a lot of folks in government always look at, you know, much like you said, how do we get you to conform to the ways that we want to see you mm -hmm. recreate and enjoy our places. Um, we've really been having the conversation with all the different groups is what are we supposed to be doing to serve you? We want to meet you where you're at. And so a lot of our programming, a lot of the things we're doing, uh, and uh, I have some staff with me. Uh, Nick Nalen can raise his hand. He's my deputy administrator uh, in Con Denise. He's actually an engineer, um, but he's actually from Mexico um, and does his family does ranching in Worland, uh, Wyoming. Um, but they are the ones that lead my uh, uh, inclusion, diversity, and equity group. We actually started a group a couple years ago, and that's our primary focus, is how can we integrate this idea into everything we do. I don't care whether it's how we, we hire people and, and try to in encourage people to come work for us, but also as a state, how do we um, figure out what we do programming-wise, what we do infrastructure-wise, what we do policy-wise, um, just making sure that we meet folks where they are and provide a service to them in whichever way we can. So I think ultimately that's, that's how we're addressing it. We remove the politics and say we're public servants that need to uh, reach out to every type of person there is. That's great. Thank you, Director Bravo. Yeah. Can you tell he competes in strongman competitions? Yeah. <laughs> I get outdoors in my own way. And he's got a name like Dominic Bravo. It's like a superhero. <laughs> so we all, we all tease him quite a bit. So we've got a little less than an hour left. So hopefully you've been sitting there formulating some ideas and some questions. So I'm going to ask the panel one open-ended question that anyone can, can chime in on and answer, but then I'm going to turn it over to all of you. So just as a quick reminder, be thinking about what you want to ask, and remember, don't take anything off the table. If, you, if there's a burning question that you really want to, want to drill down on, let's spend our remaining time together digging, digging into it. So final question. And I sort of alluded to this in the beginning, and this is for anyone on the panel to answer. Our conversations, when it comes to diversity and inclusion up to this point, I would argue, have been mostly focused on gender and race. But now we're coming to this distinct point in time where the LGBTQ community, um, if you, any of you know Elise Rylander out there, she's doing amazing work um, focusing on some of these questions, um, along with other folks. We have an organization here in Colorado called City Wild. They do amazing work as well. 
focusing on the same things. Um, how, <laughs> given our focus <laughs> is diversity and inclusion, how do we start to encapsulate that conversation moving mm -hmm. forward? Any ideas or thoughts? So anyone on the panel can answer? I'm happy to start. Sure. So I was thinking, um, and I'll start this with some humor, but it's intentional. I was trying to do my nails this morning, and I failed horribly. Um, and the reason I mentioned that uh, was because I, I've been having these conversations. So it's great to, you know, I've had car ride long conversations with Elise. Um, all, there is an ecosystem of, of grassroots and community-based organizations and nonprofits that, again, have been here. That's been a phrase that I use, like in Spanish, estamos aquí. It's not like Elise just popped out of thin air uh, at the beginning of this year. She's been consistently, a, a, and they in, in general as well, in, in, in all the sense of the word, have been doing this work. Within Latino Outdoors has been that question and challenge of how do we deal with gendered language and how do we incorporate the Latinx identity because we have leaders within that. And so that's, it's important because we say there's the learning forward we do with ourselves. So that includes myself. Um, male toxicity is a real thing. When you talk, of, when you have the difficult conversations about uh, patriarchy and obviously all of the sexual harass harassment scandals, uh, they're an outcome of that it's been there. And not just gender in terms of like male, female, but also all the fluidity in between. So I'm saying that because like how do we do that? It, for me it starts in at least three ways. There is First, as an individual, recognizing, you know, you do all the internal reflection work around your, uh, your own privileges. So I'm a hetero cisgender male to start, right? That means that both I come with privilege but also responsibility of how I relate with fellow males in terms of defining uh, male identity. And then I can be confident in who I am while also looking at what challenges them. So that's why, you know, painting my nails, it's interesting to see what the response and reaction is in terms of what presumptions and biases come up, right? Because I say it's more of a reflection of what your bias and what you're thinking than me redefining or questioning my own gender identity. Uh, one of my very first experiences was a backpacking trip in which I, I wore a, a gold sequin skirt um, to make it normative as an experience for my male colleagues. And just making it normative, it was so fascinating that Quiet, but you know, it basically told him like, oh yeah, I guess there is no big deal. Exactly. <laughs> um, the second is the in, in uh, I call it the in, inter or community work, which is, and I'm using Latinos as an example because of the work that we've done. How do we have that conversation within that space? Because it also includes uh, questions of colorism and shadism and how we value and relate what defines the identity. And with gender uh, and fluidity, it's the same thing to be able to have that, right? With my fellow Latino males, but also other organizations, how do we represent that? And that's been part of the changing in name and communication, like how do we let others know we see you? And we see you, and we value, and this is what, this is the hard question, and this is the power I am willing to give so that you are included. Um, and then the last one is institutional and organizational for me in that um, again, political climate, right? But for me, it's been about platform building. And so knowing that whenever I'm, you know, that's an example here, I'm invited to this space, there was a lot of power in naming and saying, and I could have not said anything. <laughs> I could have just said, it's an important issue, and I think we should, you know, politically speak, politically speak. It's an important issue, and I think we should definitely, you know, be aware of it. As opposed to, this is a platform and like, let's name some things that also include some self-discomfort and for others to be able to do that. Uh, and that can be hard. But, I, but what I found in communicating with others is there's an appreciation for that vulnerability and exploring that, that space because um, to be inclusive doesn't mean, comes with that discomfort if you come from a place of bias and privilege that you just took for granted and didn't want to touch. Thank you. So. Anything to add? Want to add that? Um, I think it's just a conversation that just keeps going. I mean, there isn't like an end, like 
you know, going to be an end. Like, oh, we solved it, and now we can go on to the next thing. This is something that all of these conversations around diversity, equity, inclusion are always continuing. And we don't have to necessarily have a, you know, <coughs> an end or a response that, you know, makes, like um, Jose said, makes everybody feel good. You know, that's not, <laughs> that's not what, the, you know, these kinds of conversations are about. They just continue. And there doesn't have to be a, you know, closure, I guess. It's what I find in a lot of these conversations and conversations that we have with our students and our staff and constantly trying to, you know, make sure our staff understand how our, how our students feel. But, you know, we're also learning a lot from, from that generation, from our students. I mean, they're coming to us and saying, you know, you know, this is how I feel, this is what I need. And so, um, you know, we just have to stay open and know that there is going to be that closure, that there's going to be those, um, you know, difficult conversations. Representation. Yeah, <clears throat> I would uh, uh, to add to Loretta's point, there isn't, there isn't an end, there's an evolving, it's an evolving conversation. It's a comprehensive conversation. It's a holistic conversation. Uh, when you're talking about diversity, um, really honing in on that definition of what it means for you that moment in time then and there. Um, so for example, we were talking to some of your, the department heads here and, and they were talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion and, and one, one of the responses back from us was, well, what do you mean by diversity? Do you mean first generation college students? Do you mean racial diversity? Do you mean gender diversity? Call it out like you mean it, build a campaign around it. And so I think, uh, I think that's one. Uh, and then second, I, I would say, um, I would caution a lot of a lot of this just the the conversation for the sake of conversation. Um, I think sometimes we can um, get caught up in, in that revolving door of having the same conversation around the issue, um, but putting an actionable plan behind it uh, is key to moving things forward. And so one of the prime examples that I'll set uh, that I'll share is is that as an observer of, of two movements is the ninety nine percent and the Tea Party. And you look at what the 99% did and, and what they could have done and the opportunity to move, move uh, candidates forward into an office and put them in, in power, that reflected the changes in the agenda of the 99%. And you look at what the Tea Party did to actually put them in office and, uh, uh, and put uh, candidates of, of their choosing in that office, there's a difference between having the conversations and raising the issues up to a level and then putting the actionable plans behind it so that you can get tangible, act, uh, tangible results behind it. And that's, that's, uh, so that's my call out to, to the conversation. Yes, let's have the conversation, but it is as important, if not more, to have that actionable plan behind it. Strategy, I love it, thank you. Okay, gang, you got some things on your mind? Anything coming up? Any questions? Yeah, I've got a question. Please. Uh, firstly, muchísimas gracias a todos ustedes. So it's an honor to have each of you here and really appreciate um, your time and uh, all the things you've shared with us. Um, uh, uh, Juanito, right? Um, you mentioned <laughs> the, the blue light bulb. Yeah, the Juanito. <laughs> you mentioned... <laughs> One, uh, you talked about the quote about um, the, cla the best classroom is what, with one without four walls. And that brings to mind the barriers between youth and experiencing nature, kind of natural um, side of things. But um, obviously we're talking about other kinds of barriers kind of socially as well. And I'm just wondering if you guys can uh, provide some examples of other ways maybe you've been involved in breaking down other kinds of walls between races and ethnically, right? in that social space uh, within your organizations, um, examples of success, maybe your progress or something specific in, in that area, which all of you guys have been alluding to, but just kind of some specifics in terms of what's yeah. going on there. So, so the first answer to that is I would say there's this redefinition of what nature means to you and what, uh, what nature means to me. Um, and what nature means to a community as well and, and the outdoors. So is so, so you're caught up in this definition of, of the typical Sierra Club um, satchel and a walking stick and up in the mountains next to the redwoods, right? Is that, is that nature and is that qualified? Or can we also make an inclusive space to recognize that a kid uh, growing beans outside in a can in their door, uh, in their window, 
is having a valid and uh, a meaningful connection with nature and the outdoors and what's to come, right? Um, so I think that's, that's one place to start. The, the second is, is really to, to empower community with the right tools and the right skill set to be able to move on that. So one example that I'll use in Compton, um, one of, the, one of the studies, one of the research studies that we handed over to the city council and to the community members was this study around tree canopy being an indicator for violence within a community. Um, and, and the more tree canopy that you have, the least violence that you tend to have within a community because it, uh, it increases oxygen intake level for children developing and, and communities. It provides an atmosphere where communities can in, uh, engage and not be afraid to uh, step out of their doors. Um, and there's variable, different variables that, that can be spoken about there. But, but through that, we were able to build a campaign where not only were they able to recognize that as a research study, but allocate funding uh, in partnership with other nonprofits, Tree People, and uh, the the Arbor Day Foundation to in, uh, to launch a campaign around um, around tree uh, uh, one million trees in the city of LA and get some of those funds allocated to the city of Compton. Right. So those those are some of the ways where where I think we have to think about the um, the nature as not a, a point A to point B, but it starts, it is a, it is a tangible, it is an ongoing relationship that doesn't just stop when a child leaves the park boundaries, but continues uh, throughout their livelihood and, and at, it starts from, from the home. Um, and, and that's something I would share. But that's great. Yeah, I think, <clears throat> you know, for, for me, just, um, you know, in my job, I've, you know, we do gather students up and go on all these excursions and go everywhere. And um, I was in my office and had two of our students in there. Um, they were both older, you know, in our Urban Ranger program. And I heard them talking about going on, they were going to go to the Manitou Incline. And so they were talking about how they were going to meet, what they were bringing for lunch, you know, all this stuff. And I'm like, are we doing that this weekend? I mean, I had no idea that that was going to go on and it turns out they were doing their own thing and for me it was so gratifying because they you know they knew they had to have water they were getting up at you know some outrageous time in the morning to meet and so you know all of those things that we've you know kind of taught them or that they learned from either us or you know um, you know their families whatever just kind of getting organized and going and doing their mm -hmm. own you know so for me it was great because you know our you know, our experience kind of does end. And what I hope is that they continue in some way, whether it's either through their career or just keeping, you know, the fact that they, they do have a place in this space, you know, and, um, and going along. So, you know, it was just great for me to hear them, you know, organizing this thing. And then I was like, and then the mom turned on and I was like, okay, you better call me when you get back. You know? <laughs> but, uh, but so it's that kind of thing that, you know, it just, you know, we're not the, you know, we're not the only ones doing this work. You know, there's a lot of groups and people doing this and a lot of families that are doing this as well. And, you know, one of the other successes and changes that we see um, in a lot of, um, uh, natural resource agencies doing is they're making campgrounds bigger you know they're just not for one tent I mean when we go we go with like ten tents you know so even as a group we struggle to find these campgrounds that are you know big enough for our group I mean what if you have a big family you know we're gonna we're spread out all over these campgrounds so it's those kinds of things where you have to to look at you know how do you make a place for us what you know when we come and so, you know, it's just those kinds of steps that we're, you know, I think all trying to instill in our natural resource agencies and then, you know, in the, in the families and students we embrace. Yeah. You know, I, I would add that a lot of what Loretta was talking about too is almost considerate urban planning. When you start talking about parks and park development, and, you know, Loretta said the mom turned on. Latina mom turned on. And <laughs> I have to clarify that just a little bit. I think moms are moms all over the world, but especially in our culture, if mom or grandma doesn't like what you're doing, nobody's going. And if they can't go too, they want to see what's going on. And so simple things, 
Like when parks start to do construction projects or zone in a different way and understand that, I think all of you would agree when you go to most campgrounds, you've got one group campsite way in the back that's big enough to hold families of seven to 12 people, which again, grandma, grandpa, aunts, uncles, cousins, everybody shows up and they day trip. They don't necessarily go on extended backcountry experiences, right? But you, to at this point, you get one slot here, one slot there, one slot there. So even just shifting that thought process and that paradigm when it comes to construction, like no, it's not just one group campsite, you can reallocate and reproportion some of those different pieces. These are simple, low-hanging fruit things, but it requires bravery from a budgeting, from an allocation, from a leadership perspective to stand up and say, that's addressing a shifting demographic and providing a gateway <coughs> opportunity to get more people outside. Yeah. So just my two cents on that one. I'll have four, because you said like concrete examples, right? <laughs> so the first one, to me, it's pretty concrete, it's just existing, like, literally, right? There was no elk until it came to be. There was no children nature network or natural leaders until it came to be through the decisions of people, right? And, and often we say, it's like, oh, we were sitting around the kitchen table or we like, we just got together in the lobby or something and we decided to make it so, as if we had some clairvoyance as to see exactly what it was gonna turn, right? <laughs> it's hindsight. Same thing for Latino outdoors, right? There is no Latino outdoors until about the domain name. $12 a year. <laughs> 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 but that's important in existing because all of a sudden, is that ability when somebody says like, I found you, right? <laughs> Literally, you get the tweets like, where you been all my life? <laughs> um, because there's that sense of wanting to be seen and included. So that, to me, is concrete. Two is, um, it matters so much what Juan said about public funding, to know that you need to have, because at the end of the end, you know, it's about money, and we need private money, but public funding as a mechanism to say this is important and how it shapes the spaces. So what Juan mentioned is critical because the research is there. It's important of having a tree, and not just any tree, but there's a discussion about a tree in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's having been in the conversations that made those funding mechanisms happen. Like being able to say, we have all these grants. Jose, where do you think they should go to? And I'd be like, well, I know Juan's doing work in Compton, and, and he doesn't know this, right? But I'm like, you need to make sure money gets there. Mm -hmm. And we need to be specific about, about what disadvantaged community means. It's a legal term in California. So we were able to look at it and say, when we add these metrics around disadvantaged community, M this is the percentage of money that actually makes it there versus w when we just say specificity and you know a proportional amount should go to, to under underserved communities. And what happens is the traditional mechanisms of getting money, they get their money, but then new cities or new organizations realize like we, we weren't prepared for that whole process and now we've missed out. Um, yeah. Second, the third one is then similarly to public funding is knowing um, what the language is appropriate and, and, and knowing when to use your voice. Mm -hmm. So, you know, often like, we need Latino voice, get Juan, right? Um, and to know what, why are you inviting, what are you gonna say? So I'm using California again as an example because it, it's, it's happening now. So Prop 68, which is one of the, it's the newest, biggest, like $5 billion investment in basically nature. I'll say it as that. We can't say that because politically it has to be about drought prevention and all this stuff, but it's about bringing nature to communities, urban parks, um, greening spaces, uh, gas house re you know, reduction by, be by making more green space available, and also it's about giving money to community-based organizations to be able to do this work. So that's, and that came about us consistently saying, we are at this, we need to have that included, um, and the leadership saying, <coughs> you know, sometimes coded, but sometimes flat out, if you've been an affluent community and you've had this, this is not for you. Don't worry, you still have other access for funding and that's not going away. But now we're making an intentional investment <laughs> in communities that have not had this. The Central Valley, the Coachella Valley, like different parks in urban LA. Um, and then my final one, honestly, and this is like a, it's a personal sense of pride, that through the relationship building, like having the opportunity to call Sally Jewell and say, do you want to come hike with us? And she's like, I would love to, as an experience for our leaders, right? And the investment in, in leaders that are there, not just next generation because you're here, to me is important because we've gone as a concrete example from having one mom, 
her first hike was with a Latino outdoors experience. She's a mom in her mid-30s. Uh, husband, same thing. They have two amazing daughters. Their first hike, they had never done it before. They felt like we felt like we were dying because it's like, and the kids didn't want to go. Like you're, you're usual, like we just don't want to be a part of this, but we saw it, we saw it and we wanted to try it out. And over two years now they have gone from that to discovering what camping is. Because the dad actually didn't want to do camping because he experienced camping in Mexico, which was a paramilitary like youth development program. And he's like, I don't want that for my family. Um, so now like, they go to the REI store, they go to the Patagonia store, they create their own camping trips with others leading that, and the mom is going to be attending the, the CNN summit as a way to now see professionally also, like, cool, this is a space in which I feel included and I can take that. So to me, it's like those little concrete things to know that it, it makes a, a change, but it requires an intentional investment of time, money, and um, I want to call it like relationship building. And I would say I would add political will. Yes, not the political will. You know, at Governor Hickenlooper, I don't know if many of you know, he had this program here in Colorado. He wanted every Colorado to be within 10 minutes of green space. Mm. But then that kicked off a whole other conversation of mm. does a green space have a tree? Is there a trail? Mm -hmm. Is there a sidewalk? Does CDOT charge you a million dollars per mile for <laughs> a sidewalk? Do, is the sidewalk safe in a safe community? So the good news is it created all these other conversations that without the political will to dive into it a little bit, the whole journey would have been lost. And then you lay your cake on from the, 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 tech, not, you know, the tech native that you were mentioning, Juana Brown. The whole community doesn't want to go outside at all. The screen's better than just taking a walk outside. Could you actually start an initiative saying, listen, just spend 20 minutes outside a day. I don't care where, I don't care how. If it's safe and it's possible, leave your phone and your tech at home and just go outside. Is that what we need to do to actually utilize the infrastructure? So that political will, I would argue, is critical for moving some of these things forward. Awesome. Yeah. Next question. <clears throat> so, uh, let's go to the back and then up here. Yeah, uh, first I want to thank all of you. It's been awesome to get these perspectives. And um, so as a, I'm a heterosexual white male, um, so basically a poster boy of what this field looks like. And hopefully I want to be in a leadership role in conservation one day. And so I want to know, what you feel my role is to ensure I'm facilitating inclusion and um, driving this field towards the right direction. Mm -hmm. swing at that. Mm -hmm. I would argue that while they're formulating their thoughts, just being here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great start. Yeah. Yeah. That conversation. I, I think there's a sense of, I won't call it shame because that's too strong of a word. Like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm no. heterosexual and I'm white and I just I have no place in this dialogue. Yeah. Can I go to Latino Outdoors hike? Yeah. Can I be a part of Elk? Like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, so I'll I'll leave it there and let these guys talk about it. Yeah. So I would say number one, um, just uh, just recognizing your your privilege, recognizing that you know where you are and who you and and what you stand for and recognizing how you can be a good ally and training yourself on that um, uh, how you can build be a, a steward of that inclusive space not necessarily the builder of that inclusive, inclusive space but also take uh, being able to recognize when you can step up and when you can step back uh, and empower others um, and then I would say the other part of that is is when when I speak on diversity when i'm really uh at the table and and we do this with natural leaders it means everybody it means i want to have my republican counterpart at the table i want to have my uh, uh higher socioeconomic bracket counterpart at the table i want to have all of that diversity so we can really come to the table and address the 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 issue and the end goal that we all want to get to and um there's there's certainly that inclusive space that we all need to and to to um, to build that identity and build that uh, collective impact model. But there is a space in the middle that that uh, Venn diagram where we need to come towards and and do that collective impact to get to the tangible outcomes that we all want to get to. Yeah, I was looking for the quote, and uh, I guess I don't know who's attributed to, but you may have heard it. Uh, no one is asking you to apologize for your ancestors. We are asking you to dismantle the systems of oppression they built that you maintain and benefit from. So for me, is to be able to look like, what is my piece in each of those? Because um, I agree with Juan. For me, it's always been like, everybody is needed and included. 
we, we cannot be dismissive of the conservation successes we've had, of what I'll even say, like white elders, and being able to say this is what we have. What we're saying is the and component is um, that in order to build on that, we need to be, be open to how we ourselves need to change um, to continue to, to have that success, because otherwise we kind of lose what we fought for over the past 50 plus years. And so I think, you know, when I look at it for myself, just from a male perspective, it's, I always go back to that question that I have to ask, what power am I willing to give up? And if I am uncomfortable with that question, if I don't know, then at least I can start there. And it's something different for me to say, I'm not ready to give up any power. It's like, wow. Um, but that doesn't mean that you're left out because then you still have privilege and power to be able to leverage and use because it's gonna come as a default. Is, is an, you know, and it comes with, for me, it's, it's also acknowledging what spaces you can, you will have that. Because you're gonna be a much more effective, you know, to be blunt, you're gonna be a much more effective ally to other white people than hearing it sometimes from me or from Juan or Luis or Loretta. Because they'll already, that bias might get in the way that you can kind of short trick it a little bit of you and say, hold on a second. I think that's actually something important that we do need to mm -hmm. hear. Rather than it's like, there's another brown person looking very angry and upset. I don't think I want to like be there. That's great. Yes? Yeah, my question is for any panelists. And um, for programs that are seeking to expand access or increase the quality of access to outdoor experiences, or perhaps even redefine what a nature experience is, what do you see as the challenges and opportunities for translating those outdoor experiences to broadening the constituency for conservation? So for increasing political or financial support for conservation of land, water, and wildlife. It's a great question. Um, more than any time in history, you have more nonprofits that are dedicated to connecting people to the outdoors, you know, at different age brackets. Um, but but there's a, a I think there's a there's a misconception that that that's the only outcome that you can have from from that experience to have kids just experience the outdoors, and so I'll call I'll call it out because I've been very involved with this program is the Sierra Club um, it's no longer called Inner City Outings Program it's called the Inspire Connection with the Outdoors. But the whole program was modeled around the white savior complex and being able to have these trained Sierra Club members go out to communities, uh, identify underserved communities, take them out on an excursion, and then take them back to the community. Um, there was no follow-up in terms of what it meant to be a steward of those public lands and how their power, how they were building a constituency for the future. And so now you see the Sierra Club have, facing a detrimental drop in membership and support. Uh, and I think that's pretty across the board. If you look at any nonprofit organization or any advocacy <coughs> organization that's looking at advocating on behalf of public lands, you're finding that, they're, um, that everybody is scrambling to engage uh, racial diversity and younger diversity and gender diversity. And they're all, s like, we get hit, I, I think most of us get hit up on this panel. Uh, I can show you, like, three emails that I've gotten since this morning about a nonprofit that's asking the same kind of question. Um, and it's, 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 that, it's that follow through and, and it's that piece that, that, uh, that um, how, how do you start to build that constituency? How do you still start to empower the community so that they can take ownership over the message and the advocacy and, and that system of, of place? I think one of the organizations that has done it by far the best uh, that I've seen out there is the Hispanic Access Foundation. So I would encourage you to look at their model. Uh, the other organization that I would encourage you to look at is Girl Trek, who is just focused on engaging uh, black women to take a 20 minute walk outside of their door for, for health uh, to, and community building. And, and I mean, tremendous work that, that uh, they are, Vanessa and Morgan are doing. Um, so I would encourage you to look at those models. And then there's also the, what I, what I like to call out, and, and sometimes this is hard to for a lot of NGOs to hear, and that's um, 
One, you need to stop fighting over the same piece of pie that everybody is fighting for. <laughs> um, and two, you're better off if you can build a collective impact model and link arms with all these other nonprofits that are doing the same work or doing pieces and, and bits and pieces of the work that you're doing. Mix that up with some uh, policy experts and government agencies and some corporate members and build up that comprehensive campaign. And then third is, is recognizing that maybe at some point your nonprofit, if you're good at what you're doing, and this is the golden rule of community organizing, this is 101, uh, work yourself out of a job. If you're good enough at what you do, if you're able to empower the community to take ownership over what you are explaining them to, to, empowering them to be able to do, there's gonna be a time and moment when you can step away from that community and say, they have it, it's theirs. And that is a hard truth for, for a lot of nonprofits out there to, to hear, that maybe it's not your like you're no longer relevant and you need to think about a different system and strategy of approaching this. Yeah. Right. How do you, how does Elk address this? How do you, how do you get it? Because I mean, you, you, you see all these community leaders, but yet you deeply engage from a philanthropic level, sort of that, that front range piggy bank. How do you, how do you bridge that divide? Yeah, there's, you know, a, a big effort to do a lot of collaboratives and um, even funders are looking at you know who are you collaborating with so you know like you know Juan said we're all kind of going after that same piece of pie but you know if the pie's a little bit bigger I mean I had a funder say actually if you collaborate with City Wild you know um, you know individually they might give us both 10 but if you collaborate with somebody maybe we'll give you 50 you know and it's like oh we can do this, you know. So it's that kind of thing, and a lot of I think, uh, you know, philanthropic, uh, you know, foundations and others are kind of doing that. They're looking at, you know, how can we be more collaborative. And then in terms of your, you know, how do we, you know, translate this in terms of, you know, the conservation movement? Um, it it does revolve a lot around, you know, urban spaces. Um, I think, you know, we've underestimated, you know, that 10-minute walk to a park. You know, where is the nearest place someone can go? So, you know, we need to rally around those because a lot of those are funded by the Land and Water Conservation Fund that's mm -hmm. under attack. So, but the community, you know, you may not know that. You may not know, you know, all of the local um, and national funding that goes into just the park next door. So, um, you know, so that's the other thing that we need to do in terms of, you know, um, our experiences with our students is to, you know, we go to the Rocky Mountain uh, National Wildlife Refuge that's, you know, a stone's throw from Montbello, um, and to other local parks. I mean, we're just trying to activate them, you know, because in a lot of parks, there's just, there's like nothing in them. There's not even a playground or anything, but, you know, we'll go, we'll take our stuff, we'll bring the community to them. So, um, so there's just a lot of that, that that needs to occur, you know, in our urban communities. Yeah, I, I would add, because yes, those are, I'm still going to stress on the public funding, because it's a, it's a statement about what we value. And we don't question it when it comes to some aspects of education. We certainly don't question it when it comes to military spending. Um, but to, that way to really frame nature, the outdoors, and conservation, both as, uh, as a needed part of the health system, as a needed part of the education system, and even, you know, what Stacy Bear <coughs> with uh, Sierra Club Outdoors has been doing, like, this is protection of the homeland at its purest sense. So as a veteran, like this is the responsibility I carry. That's powerful, which to me goes to one of the newest pieces is, it's still about for me, it's like what are the cultural norms about how we value and ultimately even what, what's cool. We, sometimes I think we're still challenged and struggle with like the quote unquote hippie mother earth type of narrative about nature, right? Like, I'll use the phrase, you know, like tree huggers still is something that image-wise, communication-wise, can sometimes be lobbed against you as a negative thing rather than owning it as something like this is a positive. And like, how is, how is the outdoors cool right now? That's my question. Like, and who's making it cool? Uh, and who's not making it cool? And why? And obviously that's a bit of a trick question because cool is defined in so many ways. 
But honestly, it's the same way. And, and I look like, well, what's uh, what's the best, really cool outdoor conservation meme that you got so excited to share? And like, people are talking about it in the same way that Beachella, you know, is like a thing. That it's that space about like, this is so excited that I want to share it with you, my fellow young peer. <laughs> so that with with uh, with intention of humor. And that's why I'm really excited about part of the work to support others and the messaging and the branding and the components in which we just take that as normal of like, I'm just as excited about like going hiking today as about the new Jordans that were coming out or about the new, you know, track that's gonna drop from so and so. I mean, like, to me that, when we have that, as part of the normal like growing up experience again, that's what I'm excited about too. And just one quick add to that. Um, I think that there's a misconception that, that actually my, my partner, Vanessa, calls out all the time. And that's that there's, when you're talking about racial diversity, you're talking about low income. And that's just not true anymore. Uh, I think that there's a tremendous show, uh, economy force behind mm -hmm. the African American community, the Latino community. And um, there's a lot of work and, and a lot of uh, movement especially in the outdoor recreation industry right now to recognize that you don't need to look at us as low income. Um, it is very much, we, we, we're, a lot of us are okay. Um, we, we just don't want to buy your stuff because we don't see, <laughs> yeah, that's true. because we don't see ourselves in your advertisement. Your messaging is not talking to us. And, my ch my challenge has always like as long as I've been connected to 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 outdoor brands, is look at what Ford and McDonald's yes. and Procter and Gamble have done. They got this thirty years ago. They've been doing this for a while. Like they they got it because they were ahead of the data. They got you know they got multi million dollars of, of of marketing dollars behind them. Why is it taking so long for the outdoor recreation industry to catch up? And, and I think we're making a lot of progress, so, so I want to stress that there is a lot of progress happening right now yeah. uh, with brands like REI, Patagonia, uh, and others uh, out there, and s some of the smaller brands as well. But, but I think it's, it's taken us a, a while to catch up. Yeah, but, but that's a concrete success story too, I think, like going from uh, Vanessa, um, no, I'm sorry, Victoria Serna, one of you know, faculty at, for the Natural Leaders Network, her excitement about seeing, like, this is the first brown woman I've seen on the cover of REI catalog. I've been going to OR for years, and she, like, sent us the text, right? So excited. This was, like, five years ago or something like that, to, like, the latest REI catalog. It's predominantly, I would say, like, young leaders of color, representative of the movements and organizations we've all, you know, been blessed to be a part of. Like you, you might see. recognize the voice, uh, face in there. <laughs> <laughs> or, or the uh, an outside magazine cover. Outside. That's the newest one. Yeah. Um, well, and you know, uh, you bring up a, a good point that, and to your earlier question, what can I do? You know, when you think about leadership paradigms, and even just thinking of that, and the fact that it took that long. I mean, Outside Magazine, their headquarters is in Santa Fe, New Mexico, which you think about that culture and that community they're surrounded by. What? How? How are you representing the culture that you activate in? I'm sure most of you know about the outdoor retailer show that now comes to Denver as opposed to Salt Lake City three times a year. Um, for the winter show, and again, winter sports are predominantly not driven by a pretty diverse population. Um, skiing, snowboarding, ice climbing, some of those pieces. But within that show, Icelandic Skis, which is a ski company here in Colorado, they have a fashion show and a concert up at Red Rocks every winter, open to the public. If you've never done it before, it's pretty fun to go to Red Rocks mid-January with your big puffy and hang out and listen to music. Rick Ross was playing, for God's sakes. It was really fun. But for that fashion show, I asked a really simple question. Who are your models going to be yes. displaying the clothing and the brands for the outdoor industry? And the leadership for this multi-billion dollar trade show said, well, there's an ad agency and a modeling agency in LA. Here are the people that we choose. Um, and because our office was one of the sponsors of this fashion show, I said, I want to see who you're putting on stage. And the pictures that they sent were the pictures that you would expect from a normal modeling show. And I said, no, actually that's not what we're gonna do. We have all these organizations, we have all these people that represent the color, the shape, the size, the gender of our industry, and those are the people that are gonna be walking the catwalk or you will not get my money. 
It was a three month conversation <laughs> to move that. But to Jose's point, I had people come up later the next day at the trade show and say, for the first time, I saw myself on stage wearing the gear. And what was that brand? That was pretty cool. Right. I think I could, add, I want that. I want that coat. I want that pair of pants. So it's simple things like that. We've <coughs> just never explored that paradigm and made the efforts to crack it open because there's the expected and then there's the unexpected. So you have to be brave enough to lean into that dialogue a little bit. And, really and, great question. But yes. then, and the voices that came, because I want to stress, you know, the Instagram posts and stories of the people who, you know, of the, mon the models the that you got, yeah, that was they awesome. were just beaming with appreciation and excitement. So I, I really want to stress this because We've been having a conversation about are we doing good enough and not, and like OR is still being called out and whatnot. But we can't understate all of the work that Luis has done that often doesn't, I think, get valued or recognized because he's also not out there giving the article and saying, look how great I did. But, <laughs> I, but it's important because this is an exact moment of like, this is where I'm going to use a leverage to prove a point, to make, not prove a point, but make a point in a statement that, that ripples out. I got to walk the catwalk yeah. for the first day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's very awkward. I didn't know what to do with my hands. <laughs> <laughs> I just went out like that. I had no idea what was going on. But you shifted the paradigm yeah. and the dialogue, and I think that's our journey. Yes, ma'am. Good question. Um, thank you for being here. It's a super incredibly valuable conversation. I'm really appreciating it. Um, my, I have two questions. Okay. My first question is speaking to the opposite side of this success. Um, I have some friends who work for stock agencies in advertisement and media and um, have these incentives to, to capture people of color in their advertising in the outdoor, for the outdoor industry and to be disseminated to the public. And also in conservation, on the other side of that, there are all of these organizations, nonprofits, popping up with these checkbox models for capturing diversity and inclusion. And that's something that um, I've kind of struggled with in understanding. And I, I, Another example is I have a friend who's native who's been asked to do voiceovers because they want an ethnic voice to have to be represented in a voiceover. Um, so I guess my question is like, how do you grapple with those, that other side of yes, there are successes, but there are also some things that um, we have to be able to figure out how to, how to grapple with. Um, so that's one question one. Second question is, I went to a similar panel in diversity and inclusion at the Wild and Scenic Festival this past year, and... Um, Teresa Baker. Uh -huh. Sorry? Teresa Baker. Yeah, Teresa yeah. Baker, and Patagonia. And Patagonia and Forced Forced yeah, were. and it was incredible. <laughs> um, but I, I also realized that I think there's a lack of a standardized platform for people to engage across the outdoor industry and conservation. We're facing really similar issues and having really similar dialogue, but we're not all connected, um, and it's really... Yeah, yeah. Oh, it gets really me it's so excited. It's so really interesting I, it is. thread that I found and been curious about. There, there are venues, and they're exploding, and I want the panelists to talk about this a little bit, but I do want to acknowledge something that these folks don't get enough credit for. We've got other folks out there. Len Nessifer, who leads Natives Outdoors. Um, Rue Mapp, who leads Afro Outdoors. There's Brown Girls Climb. And if you're a cynic, you could point to each one of these folks and the organizations that I mentioned and their leadership and say quite simply, token, 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 token. Their schedule, I, I literally, when I think about what they do and how they do it, and they choose to stay on this wagon train, because they're eloquent, they're educated, they're passionate, and I call it the burden of leadership. So instead of being token, I see this as these are bright shining stars that can tell the story, and slowly but surely, I'm seeing the next generation come along behind them. I mean, Jose just stepped back from Latino Outdoors, and for us, in our world, oh, wait, what? Who's gonna lead this? What, where's the voice? What's happening? And then to understand, you know, to Juan's point earlier, that these vo other voices are rising. So I think we have to challenge our own paradigm of what tokenism is and realize, you know what, if that's the leadership right now that's carrying that message, people will start to pay attention. And there are other venues out there to get the gang together, to your second question, that, you know, Jose, you were talking about shift. I think that's an important one. We're trying to do stuff at the outdoor retailer show as well yes. to get different communities together. 
Um, but you guys want to talk about some of the different things that you do? Uh, the Children in Nature Network, getting the leaders together. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff going on. Elk has gatherings. My God. So, yeah. I mean, I'll jump real quickly because I think I just, post, <laughs> just posted some about that. Um, <laughs> So five, four years ago, five, I 2013 was it, when I sent Juan the, my first email, hey Juan, you don't know me. But, um, but I like to look back at those because it reminds me right now when I get those emails and, and making that judgment call, like who is this? Like, let me know who you are and what you want, right? Um, so, you know, when Latino Outdoors Instagram came up, there was no native outdoors, all of this amazing blossomness that like over the past two years, they weren't there. And two things about like, A, we're not meant to hold that space. Like anything Latino has to go through, I was like, no, go create your own thing. Now there's like, at least, I lost track at 20 different type of Latinx type of outdoors accounts. There was literally a Latinas outdoors, there was a Latinas who hike, there was a Latina, I'm like, and I told them like, run with it. Because it's about you being visible and then we, we'll have to figure out how we can help each other. Um, but it started with like Juan reaching back and saying, you know, hey brother, like, okay, like, let me talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's that component, and Instagram is just one example and model, right? Second, on, on the branding, it's been a learning process. You know, like, I'll, I'll look to, to, to the leadership here as examples of like, how do you navigate this, right? Because how do you then you get to the point of saying no? I, I don't, I'm not going to be part of that campaign because of this or this or this. Or being able to ask, so what's the, uh, the fee that you pay for talent? Um, if you don't have it, then I'm like, then good luck, right? Or let others know if you get approached by this brand, just as a heads up, they're not going to be able to do that. Or if I get uh, a fee of some kind, then like the last one, we're just going to come out with the Go RVing one. Um, and they're asking me, and they're like, well, what do you want to do? I said, I want to do this where we have three amazing leaders that you probably wouldn't know or approach. They need to be included in it, and whatever you're going to give me, like, you need to split it up and pay them. Uh, because, like, I'm okay with that, right? Like I said, I have my REI cover. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't need to have that. I said, like, oh, my God, the, this year needs to be included. It's like, who else needs to be given access to that platform? And similarly, when we first started looking for, my first blessing of a convening was the Children in Nature, uh, it's called Gathering back then, now it's an international conference, <laughs> 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 to be welcome to that and saying, we li I literally got that year asked that question, where do you all hang out? Like, what do you mean? Like, you, well, where do you all hang out? And <laughs> since then, <laughs> knowing like there's been, there's been new spaces. So PGM1 is one example, people of the global majority for the outdoors, nature, and environment second year in Oakland, right after the Children Nature Network Summit. Um, in the Latino space, now there's the America's Latino Eco Festival, which happens here in Colorado. Uh, third one, fourth one now? Mm -hmm. I was, remember when it was the first one. Green Latino Summit, which is actually happening the same week that the Children mm -hmm. in Nature. These are all new spaces that did not exist five years ago. So that's the optimism knowing that every day I look at a brand, we literally like will get and it's like, why did they just do it? Like, <laughs> why did you just use that word? Or like, did you notice like <laughs> <Yeah>. how they <laughs> show this and this? So I hear you. But it comes with the burden. I call it, part of me is like having a Latino identity is that you're colonizer and colonized. So that tension is like knowing how to like know that there's good enough and then there's still work to do. Yeah, I think for, for Elk is uh, we get, you know, calls about, you know, using our students or you know, we need a student, or I get a call, can you bring some students? And so I have to, you know, we have to be very careful about, you know, what is this experience? You know, what are you talking about? And, and so I have found, you know, uh, unfortunately, some incidents where I, you know, you know, in a good faith sent a student to something and it didn't work out, you know, it was horrible. And we had to, you know, do a lot of, um, you know, kind of talking with the student and, oh my God, and, you know, so, I mean, there's just some times where, you know, they're just put in a, just a strange situation. So I do kind of watch what we, you know, what we engage in. And the other thing I'm very cognizant about is not telling their story. Or if I do tell their story, I get their permission. So, I mean, I have great stories about all of our students, but it's their story. And so it's real important for me, you know, for us when we're gonna put it on a brochure or anything that we get their permission or they write it for us so that it's their story. 
And um, but there have been, you know, times where it, you know it's a great um, honor and opportunity for one of our students to participate in, you know, in a, in something. And um, right now, one of our students, uh, Jessica Chavez, is actually the youth ambassador for the uh, Colorado outdoor recreation industry. And it's been really, you know, a great experience for her. And you know, I wouldn't have done it if I hadn't like known Luis and you know, known all of that. So it's really about that and, we, you know, where we send our students and, you know, how we participate in things. And a lot of times it's really great experiences for them. And, you know, I make sure we have staff now and, and that kind of thing. And that our young leaders are coming up and, and um, you know, they go through, through a lot of training that, um, that Juan does. So, you know, they know, you know, kind of when to say no or, you know, what that, um, you know, what that means to them. Yeah, I, I would say um, there's a there's a there's definitely a, a, an authenticity uh, to this space. Um, I think Jose experienced it with me when when he first emailed me. Um, I experienced it with Loretta when I first connected with her about recruiting some of her young leaders, and I had to pass her litmus test. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, Luis and I go back and forth, and I mean, we we yeah. so so I would say. You know, there, there's there's spaces for authenticity in in, in this. Um, in in terms of your other question, the uh, gathering spaces, I don't I don't think that there's enough. Um, there's certainly a lot, and you know, you're more than welcome to follow any one of our organizations, and you'll hear about them. Too many, I, I think they're getting too many to name, but here at close, I would point to the outdoor recreation show. Um, there's a lot of work happening here, and, and the summer I think is only going to get better. Uh, th this winter was the first one that was held here. In, Colorado summer is only going to get better, so I'll leave it to, to Luis to share that. But I would also say that that um, do not find, uh, and this is a call, like my call out for everybody is don't get comfortable in this zone, in this silo, in this echo chamber, um, because one of the successes that we've had with Fresh Tracks and being able to reach out to the uh, to the My Brother's Keeper initiative and the Native uh, Center for Native American Youth and presenting our our tool of using nature as a community, uh, as, as a tool for community building, uh, is that nature and outdoor recreation take a back seat to s issues that are dealing with suicide prevention and access to health, uh, to health, um, health services, access to uh, equal opportunity education. And those, uh, entering those spaces and, and also acknowledging that we are very much privileged to think about nature as a space uh, where we can build careers, where we can build um, uh, movement building and things like that and, and approaching it from that lens and recognizing that there are spaces and silos to be broken down across the issues. But it is, it is a, a very much a privilege for, for, I think a lot of us and for myself to, to make a career out of this, to advocate on behalf of how nature can build community, and also recognizing that when I'm sitting at the table and listening to, to those communities about w and how I can be a support to that, and allowing my issue to take a back seat, uh, supporting it, taking a back seat, but at the same time moving towards a happier, healthier, uh, more successful community. Yeah, I think, you know, I. I do want to add this because three things are, one is I still, rem I don't remember the exact moment, but it's, we say with some humor now when I was first confused for Juan, and I was like, yeah, we, we sir, I can see how. <laughs> In I the just same, posted a picture two right? days ago. Like Literally. Yeah, so we say with some humor, but it was a reminder of like, dude, we've been in this space for a while now, and the fact that. It points to that authenticity, right? Those that know us know us. <laughs> they know the clear distinction. But it's not even, so yeah, I'll, I'll just riff on that because <laughs> it, 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 it irks me so much. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because um, one, we don't even look alike, right? I could understand if you mix up Jose and Juan, like yeah, very names, right? similar yeah. names, but there are people who will approach me and talk to me about what's the next thing with Latino outdoors and I'm like, no, 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 no. Like, that's not me. I think you're talking about Jose. This is what I do. Oh, great. So Latino Outdoors is going to, no, 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 no. <laughs> like, like, are you not listening? Uh, but, but I do think that there, there is, 
there, there needs to be more of us so that there's a point where you can't even tell us, you, you can't even mix those two names up, or Loretta, or Luis, or anything like that. Yeah, but, but that's, you know, because I'm saying that's just a reminder of that. It's like, well, who t are you looking for the individual? Are you looking for the brand of the individual? Are you looking just for the brown face, so to speak? Because um, that comes up as a reminder. And then second is, is what Juan was saying is really being so aware and attentive to the native indigenous perspective and experience. Because we're talking about like, we will make the presumption that the outdoors is an amazing place in which to recreate, or even like nature's gonna provide a healing experience, while forgetting that a lot of what can be shaped around land has been trauma, right? Like, that public spaces and public lands came from the displacement and sometimes just genocidal actions of like opening those up as public lands from communities that were there. So all of a sudden we're saying like, come experience your public lands or our public lands. It's like, that's a construct that we made out of native land, for example, right? Or be able to say like, you're asking me to like come experience nature when, you know, we're out here on a reservation, basically like, this is a different set of public land boundary making in which we were forced into, and then the privilege that we have of being totally unaware of the realities of that lived experience there, and knowing like that has to come up and we have to hold that when, you know, that voice comes there and say like conservation is not a good word. Conservation is a traumatic, like, uh, violence associated word in, in our communities. And, but we use it and we celebrate it, right? So then we think about like, how, does, how do we then incorporate that as a conversation of doing that? Um, and so that's, that's the kind of thing that comes up in terms of saying uh, the privilege that Juan mentions. But also knowing ultimately for me is uh, burden of leadership, as Luis says, I specifically have chosen a middle ground, middle space, so to speak. Like Latino outdoors is strategic rather than call it you know, the Hispanic Conservation Council or like Raza in the Woods. Um, because knowing like that was gonna afford opportunities to work with the Park Service, but also be authentic enough to like work with grassroots organizations that be like, okay, you're, you're colonized, but like not colonized too far out, right? Um, and that's important because and the, the benefit of that is having the opportunity to bridge some of this. I can navigate some of those spaces well enough than be like said, I'm. I'm Latino, Chicano, you know, so I'm Latino by culture, I'm Mexicano by birth, I'm a, U, you know, I'm a U.S. citizen by naturalization, I'm Chicano by social political identity, and I'm, in, I'm Hispanic by census count, right? And I can like hold all those identities, but then also knowing that it also opens me up to basically be called out and attacked. You say like, I love parks, and then someone's like, yeah, aren't they the most amazing, beautiful, protected spaces in America's best, best idea? Like, yes. And then someone is like, oh yeah, I see how you like to support white supremacist spaces. Yeah. Then let's have the conversation. Yeah, and so to, <coughs> to wrap this up, I would, <laughs> 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 how do you encapsulate it, right? Yeah. That's my question. And every time I sit with these three, I can, I can kind of go forever, but I think it's this concept that this conversation has no guardrails and it has no boundaries. And the most critical factor in all of this is regardless of your cultural or gender identity, your socioeconomic status, you have to be willing to lean into the dialogue first and foremost. So please join me in thanking our panelists for being willing to lean in. Will you come up and kind of talk about what's next? Absolutely. Would you mind? Well, I'll take a call. Okay. Yeah, I just want to echo a thanks to the panel. Luis must have got up at like 3 a.m. to come here from D.C. this morning. 3.27. Yes. There you go. Ask him what time we went to bed. 2.22. <laughs> it's been so appreciated, and I just I want to say thanks again. I want to thank everybody that came today, our friends from Wyoming in particular, thank you for joining us. It, if you're like me, you're left with questions um, that you would like to ask the panelists, and lo and behold, I've got that opportunity for you. Uh, we're going to have a, a lunch available to you all out in Sherwood Forest in front of the Forestry Building.
to the south of the Forestry Building. And you're all invited. The panelists will be there, and I know you're probably anxious to ask more questions, so please join us there. Um, Mark, thanks so much for putting the panel together. That's been awesome. Mm -hmm. And thanks to you all. See you immediately over at Forge. Mm -hmm. Mike, do you want to say something about an announcement about tomorrow's diversity? Uh, I think I think the dean already said it, but we do we have another uh, talk tomorrow. Um, Stephanie Green at 11 a.m. in the Wagar Building, 133, uh, with a similar uh, theme. All right, over at Forest Street now. Thank you. Thank you.